Hello, welcome to BMC. I'm Dr. M. Today we are going to discuss the age-old factoid that floats around where people say for every calendar year our dogs and cats age seven years. Would you be surprised if I told you that this is actually a myth? We are going to dive into the science behind what we know about the canine and feline aging process and most importantly we're going to take that knowledge and use it to help us give our pets the veterinary care that they deserve in each of their life stages. So join me, you'll learn something today. It's an incredibly widely held belief that dogs and cats age seven years for every calendar year. When I was researching into where this originated from, it was tough to find a single source. I think that there are a few factors that contributed to making this a widely held belief. One, it is simple. <laughs> and people like a rule of thumb that's really easy to remember and that's simple to apply. Most likely has its origins in folklore and observational data from people as they were living with their pets. And if we consider that the average lifespan for humans is about 70 to 80 years, and then we think about how many dogs live 10 to 12 years or so, it makes sense that people would then just logically apply, okay, well, one calendar year equals seven years of aging for our dogs. This seven year rule is flawed because it's overly simplistic and it neglects to address the fact that there are a number of different factors that influence the aging process. We also have to remember that both dogs and cats mature and grow exceptionally quickly in their first year of life. So they do a lot more aging per calendar year when they are young compared to when they are adults. We also have to remember that genetics play a role and we also need to remember that there is a general rule within dogs that the smaller breeds tend to have longer lifespans than medium-sized, large, or giant breed dogs. A number of factors contribute to how each individual is going to age. So there's a difference between talking about populations and talking about individuals here. And so your local veterinarian will need to be guiding you with how different lifestyle and risk factors apply to your individual animal, and they will be able to guide you best. So of course, genetics can influence how pets age, and we see this with specific dog breeds, how one specific dog breed will have shorter telomeres than other dog breeds, and when shorter telomeres are present, that is associated with a shorter lifespan. They are at the end of chromosomes, they are repetitive non coding base sequences and they shorten with each replication event. We also know that the telomere length corresponds with lifespan. When the telomeres become too short to protect the coding portion of the chromosome, then replication of the cells becomes dysfunctional and this contributes to the aging process. At least this is the best theory we have about telomeres at this time. We also need to be considering the genetics of the animals, especially if we are purchasing them through a breeder. Obviously, if you are going through a humane society or an SPCA, you don't have any control over this, but we need to be supporting excellent and ethical breeders who are doing as much health screening as is possible before they are considering breeding an animal and passing those genetics on. There are also going to be lifestyle components. So if there is obesity present for that animal, we have research studies um, on Labradors where Labradors that maintained a lean body condition score had significantly longer lifespans by a couple of years compared to their litter mates who were kept in the same conditions but were slightly overweight. So we know that a lean body condition score is incredibly important when we are thinking about lifespan. And what we also have to remember is that the lean dogs also had a longer time before different disease processes that are more common in seniors started showing up. So for the overweight dogs, we would expect things like arthritis and diabetes and chronic pain, etc., to show up in at younger ages than we generally see them in dogs that are kept a lean body condition score. 
So we need to consider both the overall lifespan, but also the quality of life that is going on within that lifespan. We don't necessarily want more years if those years are going to have a poor quality of life. Most veterinarians, myself included, are firm, firm proponents of quality over quantity of life. Nutrition also matters and feeding research-based nutrition that meets the WSAVA guidelines is very helpful as having balanced complete nutrition it matters i have done some videos on nutrition in the past i will link them all in the video description for you so when we consider more accurate pet aging charts they do vary a little bit depending on who has produced them what research was available at that time we have a couple that tend to be most commonly used, so we'll discuss those now. For cats, my favorite resource is from catcareforlife.org. Cat Care for Life is associated with a number of experts in feline veterinary medicine. They break up the feline aging process into six subsections. When we're looking at kittens from zero to six months, in the human aging equivalent, that is about 10 years of aging. By the time a cat is two years old, that would be the human equivalent of about 24 years of age. But then from here, the aging starts to slow down. By the time a cat is 10 years old, that's roughly equivalent to 56 human years. By the time they reach the end of the senior bracket at 14 years of age, that's about 72 human years. And then they have super seniors that go up from there because it's not uncommon these days for our cats to live well into their teens. I even have a couple of patients that have made it to 20, 21 years. And what I love about Cat Care for Life is that you can select which life stage your cat is in, and then it will bring you to a bunch of different subsections about what you should be expecting in order to best care for that cat at that age. It might mean blood pressure tests, blood work, more frequent veterinary visits, vaccines, etc., etc. And this website is lovely and clearly laid out and nicely based on the best practices that we currently have available to us today. Now for dogs, we don't have an equivalent website, which is a shame, but to be fair to dogs, the aging is a lot more complicated because we know that the size of the dog also plays a role. There are a few charts that I'll see floating around being commonly used. The overall trend, of course, is that when they're young, they go through a lot more aging than a human does in the first few years of life. However, we need to remember this is still a bit of a simplified version because specific breeds may not correlate correctly with the size range that they fall into. I think, for example, of the brachycephalic breeds, due to all of their health issues, their lifespans are significantly decreased and they also have a lot more suffering and a worse quality of life. Now there are people like Dr. McKenzie, aka the Skept Vet, who are recently starting to do some work on the canine aging process and they have put out some publications uh, proposing some ways in which to assess how each individual is doing. And there's a proposal of a framework that they are calling a canine geriatric syndrome. And it would be looking at physical changes, functional changes, behavioral changes, what disease processes are present, and so on. I'm incredibly interested to see where this research goes and am excited as it should enable us to care even better for our dogs as they become seniors. With aging comes an increased risk of what we call the three Ds. This is disease, disability, and death. Currently, the things that are proven to help improve lifespan and health span prevent obesity, offer regular species appropriate exercise and enrichment, and be seeking regular veterinary care. When our dogs and cats are adults, generally seeing a veterinarian at least once a year for a physical exam, keeping up with their dental care, keeping up with their heartworm prevention, flea prevention, vaccine boosters, etc. is all appropriate. And then as our pets 
get into the more senior stages of their life, we need to be increasing the frequency that we bring our dogs and cats to see their veterinarian. For both dogs and cats, we need to screen for a number of common issues we see in seniors. It may also be recommended to be considering things like abdominal ultrasound and chest x-rays to be screening for tumors. We have to consider three aspects of preventive health care. The first we'll call primary. When we are discussing primary prevention, we are wanting to avoid and prevent diseases from happening in the first place. So this includes matters like vaccinations, routine heartworm prevention, GI parasite treatments, etc. Then we have secondary prevention. This includes the early detection of disease. The earlier we can detect a disease process, the more we can do to slow down the progression of that disease. Lastly, we have tertiary prevention. This is where we're looking to reduce the impact a disease process has on that individual animal. So this might mean medications, nutrition changes, exercise changes, supplements, and the like. I would love to hear from you what you found helpful about this video, and if you have suggestions you'd like me to cover in a future video, please comment them down below and I will add them to my list. Every week I highlight a recent comment from one of you. This week I'd like to highlight this one. I really, really appreciate all the interaction that you all do with BMC it helps me out so much. Anything that you can do to show YouTube that you are interested in this content is incredibly helpful to me. I do put out a new video most Fridays, so I look forward to seeing you in the next one. You take care. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Happy girl. Yeah. All right, <laughs> the going out is getting a little slower. <laughs>